Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for that, Rob. That was a good opening salvo for everybody to, to follow up to. I apologise, I don't have any slides um, because I've got a very sort of brief two-page statement that I want to run through. I've taken the liberty of writing it down rather than just freewheeling through this because I wanted to make sure that I picked up on the correct uh, salient points. Um, so my name is Caroline Rayner. I work for Costain. Um, Costain, as you know, or may not know, is, is a tier one construction contractor. So I don't work for an archaeological unit. I'm not a consultant. Um, I'm actually a senior project manager in the construction sector. Um, however, I was an archaeologist and once an archaeologist, always an archaeologist. And that is partly the reason I'm here today. Um, but I'm here to give you my own particular take on your organisations and how I perceive what you do uh, and the work that you deliver for us. So on the 13th of November 2018, Bristol Council became the first UK council to officially declare a climate emergency. They were then followed by approximately 310 other councils and local authorities, including Nottinghamshire County Council, our host county for this year's CIFA conference, who also declared a climate emergency in May 2021. So far, so good. Everyone's agreed it's a climate emergency. However, it's worth noting that it took three years for that group of organisations uh, to complete the process of declaration and Nottingham was by no means the last in the queue. So why was this? Surely everyone has acknowledged that we're in a period of unprecedented change, standing at the edge of an environmental and climate precipice. So why did it take three years to complete this simple act of acknowledgement? The answer sits within organisational structures, cultures and behaviours. As archaeologists, we talk a lot about culture. We spend a lot of time studying behaviours in the past, the tangible and intangible things that we can infer from what we find. Um, but large organisations with thousands of employees have complex hierarchies. They have financial imperatives and highly structured governance. And they do not just stop or turn in a single moment. Their bulk and momentum prevent that. Um, they prevent rapid change, uh, and like a large ship, they're basically very slow to stop and very difficult to turn once they're moving. Transformation takes time, and we see transformation in the archaeological record all the time. We can track it through the material culture, so we see that transformation. Um, but transforming attitudes, behaviours, and organisational cultures can take years or even decades to orchestrate and fully embedded within organisations. And that's even when everyone is in agreement about the drivers and the outcomes from the outset. So in a period where urgent change is required, this is going to be a massive problem for many sectors and large organisations. And quite a few people in the room are part of large organisations or governmental bodies. There's also the level of perceived threats to be considered. So the timescales in which change will take place and what it means to us as individuals and obviously the impact it will have on our respective organisations. Our sense of urgency as humans is based on two key factors. Time scale, is the risk now or is it in the future? Uncertainty, is the risk proven uncertain or is it still uncertain? Are we still not quite sure that something's going to happen? And if it does happen, how bad is it going to be? And what is it really going to look like and mean for us? Do we really believe it is likely to happen? Currently, we are told that in 100 years or less, our planet will be fundamentally less hospitable to us and pretty much everything else on it. Environmental extremes will become the norm. Drought and flood will increase. Flooding, tidal surges and permanent flooding as sea levels rise are already changing our coastal geography and will become incrementally worse in the next 25 years. 25 years is not very far away. Food and resource scarcity will provoke mass migration from southern Europe, northern and central Africa and the Middle East to cooler, wetter northern climes. However, many recent extremes of weather are easily written off by people as a blip or aberrance and not an indicator of a growing pattern of unwanted and unmanageable change with catastrophic impacts for future generations. This is because the impacts and effects of climate change for many are later they're not now, they're happening later. And they're uncertain. As I mentioned, we're not sure what they're going to look like. And it's very difficult to quantify, measure and be certain of how they're going to impact us. Therefore, there is less of a behavioural imperative on us as people to make real and urgent change. And that's basically what all the prevarication boils down to when you look across many organisations. If the impacts were now uncertain, 
then many of the behavioural barriers and impediments would immediately be removed. So why am I talking about behavioural and cha behavioural change and culture? My provocation today is that I put it to you that organisations which sit within the heritage sector are arguably better placed to deal with these impending environmental changes and the behavioural and cultural changes which will be required by way of response. As organisations, you are smaller, leaner, often with less complex governance than many of the corporate beer moths. The nature of funding and its very many limitations uh, fluctuating staff levels and workloads mean that you've had to be leaner, more adaptable and able to pivot in new directions to fulfil new or changing requirements. You are already masters of rapid change and adaptation. Whether or not you recognise it is one thing, but you are. As a group of academics and professionals working within the heritage sector, you have for years championed the benefits of sustainability via the retention of historic assets and management of the embodied carbon that they represent, before anybody was even talking about embodied carbon. You championed the reuse and recycling of raw materials and resources, recognising the value of a circular economy before anyone had even coined that term and applied it to environment and sustainability. You were there future-proofing existing buildings to support the needs of generations to come, and you've also championed and nurtured sustainable crafts and trade skills which are required to support the maintenance and repair of these assets. Furthermore, within your staff cohort, you employ a group of highly educated, environmentally aware individuals who have chosen a career specifically where the principal output is social value and a better understanding of our environments. Your teams comprise people who, for years, have championed and embraced sustainability through active travel, lower carbon diet choices such as vegetarianism and veganism, and who are vigilant and aware of changes to the natural environment because practical involvement in archaeology and in archaeological sciences requires an innate ability to understand the impacts of changing environmental conditions on humanity. For a long time, some of these behaviours were weaponised against us as archaeologists. Um, they were used to support an amusing archaeological stereotype, which was often peddled by the media. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Um, and it was used to support a shallow, inaccurate caricature of the profession. However, I suspect they're not viewed through quite the same lens these days, now that people are forced to address desired behaviours in the face of a climate crisis. In summary, my provocation to you today is that you and your people already possess the culture values and behaviours almost every other business in every other sector is now frantically working to understand, cultivate and embed across their organisations and they are paying lots of money to get the same kind of culture that you already possess within your organisations. Um, and so this is why I believe that your people are your greatest asset and resource in this climate emergency and I would challenge you to actively engage with them on this subject seek their ideas, innovations and perspectives to support your own route to net zero.